Good evening, everyone. I'm Braden Abraham, and I'm the Artistic Director at Seattle Rep. And welcome to another episode of Creative Conversations. I'd like to start tonight by acknowledging that here in Seattle, we are on the traditional land of the Coast Salish people, and including the Duwamish people, both past and present. We honor with gratitude both the land we are on and the Duwamish tribe. This acknowledgement, of course, is not meant to take the place of authentic relationships with indigenous people, but it is a first step in acknowledging the land we are on. Uh, tonight, my guest is Skip Mercier. Skip is a set puppet and costume designer, and he has designed close to 400 productions over his long career. His work has garnered many awards on Broadway, off-Broadway, and at regional theaters around the country, including Seattle Rep and many others. He's worked with leading theater makers such as Bill Irwin and groundbreaking directors such as Julie Taymor. And he's a longtime collaborator with director and playwright Tina Landau, whose production, The Time of Your Life, some of you may remember um, that Skip designed, is still one of the great uh, productions in my memory that I've ever seen on the Bagley stage. Uh, he's also a longtime professor of design and he currently teaches in our own backyard at the University of Washington. Skip's one of my favorite collaborators. He and I have worked together on plays such as Ibsen in Chicago and Well, and he also designed Cheryl West's recent production, big hit production of Shout Sister Shout that was on the Bagley stage last fall. Uh, I'm really pleased that he can join us tonight. Skip, welcome. Hello. Hey, Skip. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. You're welcome. I'm uh, in Connecticut. You're in Connecticut. I am. How are things out there? Things are cold. It's, it's getting it's, cold now. Yeah, it's pretty great. But it's beautiful. The leaves are all changing and it's, it's really pretty. And you're teaching classes remotely. I am. I'm, I was just with my students in Seattle 20 minutes ago. So yeah, it's, it's a amazing. wild ride. I know it's amazing. All of us, how, how, how close we all are through this and how far apart at the same time. Um, uh, so I wanted to start tonight, just, you know, going back to when you started as, as a, as a designer, how, how did you, how did you come to design? I think so many people in the theater, they came at it from a, from another area, usually acting or something else, but do you remember like when that moment was where it clicked for you when you knew that design was something that you wanted to do? I do. That's just such a great question. Um, I was, a, I think, I think my, my family thought I was going to be a student forever. I was because I couldn't find what I wanted to do. And I, um, I was at UC Berkeley and one day I, I was an English major and one day I wandered down to a part of the campus I had never seen before. And there was this little brown wooden building and eucalyptus trees and the door was open and I wandered in and a guy was sitting in an office at a drawing table and his walls were covered with images of the theater. And I had never seen a professional show. I had never had any it, it was, I was so fascinated that somebody actually did this and thought about this and what, it just never frankly occurred to me. And this man, his name is Henry May, just let me look. And I was there for almost an hour and I just went from image to image to image to image. And he said, um, who are you? And I said, uh, I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm I'm an English major, you know. And I said, "Did you do these?" And he said, "Well, yeah, but I didn't do them alone. Mm. I, I I worked with a lot of people to do these." And I said, "They pay you for this?" <laughs> I mean, it was like, I just had no idea. And he asked me if I could draw, and I said, "I love to draw." And I've always doodled and always, you know, and, and he said, well, draw me. And he gave me a little message pad and I just did a sketch of him. And he said, you need to take my design class. It was, and that's really how it happened. And so I, I did. 
And I took it for a month and it was a advanced design class. And he was asked to do an opera and he couldn't do the opera. And he said, I have this guy. He doesn't know what he's doing, but he just has nothing but theater instinct. And I ended up designing the set and costumes for Orfeo and won all these awards. And I just, I sat in the back of an opera house and I felt an audience actually at the same moment all react to something that I thought of. Mm. And I was hooked. Mm -hmm. I, I was completely hooked. And I've been hooked ever since. I'm still hooked. That's such a magical story how you just wandered into it. Totally. Your curiosity led you in, in there and, and then and you and you found this new path. Well, yeah, I was probably skipping a class. But. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but, you know, no, what, that, it was great. I mean, he changed my life. Yeah. He, he changed my life. And, and he was a person that was so connected to his life and he was really happy. Mm -hmm. And that's the thing that impressed me the most. It was somebody that gets up every morning excited to be alive because he's creating. Right. What he said to you about, you know, yes, I did these, but I did, I also did them with other people. And, yeah. and you know, that, that's something I think as designers, directors, it's, it's interesting to talk about because as theater art, artists, all of our work is in relationship to each other. And yet when we start a process, we always start from a specific point of view. Each of us has a specific point of view because without that, there really is no, there's not, I mean, there's no way in, right? So it's both personal and collaborative. And just curious, like, how does the, how does the design process start for you? It must start differently, or does it start in the same way for every show and every kind of thing? It, it's, it starts different. Well, th you mentioned time of your life. That, yeah. That's a great, I remember, I remember when Tina sent me, Tina Landau sent me time of your life. And she said, I want to do this at, um, you know, I, I really just want to do this play. We're going to do this play. And so I read it and I didn't get it. I just didn't get the play. I didn't get the story. I didn't. And so I called Tina and I said, I don't get this. And she just <laughs> said, read it again. And she hung up and, <laughs> and I read it again. And it was like, it was like, bricks click or something it was like time of your life is one of those plays where you you have to get in mm -hmm. inside it in the belly of it in a way and once i was in the belly of it i called her back and i said oh my god and she said you're such a dope i mean it was it was just i mean and that's our relationship you know it's yeah. it's just uh so that one was that one was hard to get into typically for me i just read the play and i read it and read it and read it until i'm in it until i find a way in it and then and then it's really coming to the ta i mean that's why i love collaborating with you i just i come to the table without an idea I come to the table with the play mm -hmm. and knowing that you and I will create the world of it, that right. we will, you know, so it's, it's really just coming with a, a knowledge of the play. Right. And that it's sort of trusting that knowledge, right? It's like, you kind of have to, like you're saying, you sort of have to press this play into yourself. And then from there, then intuitive things can happen. It's like yeah. you can force the idea in, but if you can, if you can get inside it, um, then something will happen in that conversation or in that moment when you're least expecting it in a way. And I'm lucky because I, I, you know, have had the advantage of working with really good people that mm -hmm. don't feel intimidated by the job. And mm -hmm. so I'm not intimidated my, by my job. I, I, I know I can do anything that we can dream of. Mm -hmm. And so you, you can go to that table empty mm -hmm. without this fear of, you know, producing. Or, I mean, sometimes, yeah, sometimes I feel like, and this kind of gets into a com like question about how you teach theater too, because sometimes I feel like in the theater, our, our jobs have almost become too specialized. Like it can, it can kind of become where each person is in charge of their, their specific area. 
And, but when you have the right team of people, there can be a lot of blurring of the lines as you're talking about. And I just feel like for you, like the title of designer is almost too limiting to describe what you do because you're, you're making from, you know, you're making it in ways in which you collaborate with other artists and you're making theater with other theater makers who I would describe, like, especially someone like Tina or Bill Irwin or Julie Taymor. These people are, you know, they're like, they're sort of slash artists. They're, they have their hands in a lot of different areas of the theater and, and you do too. I mean, you, you, you also direct and you, you, you're kind of, you're a, a designer, but I really feel like you approach it as a dramaturg too. And so I'm just wondering as, as a teacher of design, how do you talk about what defines the role of the designer? How do you encourage your students to embrace that role and, and all the different sort of facets of it? Boy, we're, we're having that conversation almost daily. And it's a reminder to, you know, I'm not putting on my teaching head. It's really a reminder to myself all the time that it is boundless. And if we're in a, if we're in a box, which we're in right now, it's how do you make that box boundless? And that box isn't needing necessarily to be defined by a role. Your role is director, your role is design, costume designer, your role is set designer or lighting designer. It's really your, your role is to create. And so the conversations that we're having is the idea of trying to really stop that limitation. You know, I think when I came to UW, one of the things that attracted the faculty to me was the, that I, I consider myself a sonographer. So I do sets and costumes typically at right. the same time. I don't think of one without the other. It all kind of blends together in, in my thoughts. And I'm really you know, excited about these younger artists are coming up with absolutely no boundary of ability. I mean, we have one student right now that's doing the sets, costume, and lights for a, a device piece that is, you know, nobody knows what's going on. And, and it's in the work they're doing is fantastic. Hmm. And, and it, that's what I'm very hopeful for the future of, of these designers, that they're not limiting themselves by a certain sensibility. The trick then is the skill set that's required with each sensibility. Right, right. Because you still have to have that specificity. Like Picasso had to be able to, to, to draw and paint realistically, or maybe he didn't have to, but he did in order, and then to be able to abstract it and break it and try new things. Absolutely. I mean, I remember the first time I saw that famous drawing Picasso did of a bull that was like three lines. And it <laughs> was like, and I, 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 you know, I was probably 15 years old. And I said, I can do that. I don't know why this guy is so famous, you know, and it was like, and it wasn't until you look back and understand that this was somebody that could not only meticulously draw the bull, but mm -hmm. he could find the essence of the bull in three lines. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, yeah, it's exactly that. It's, it, it's undoing. Is that part of when you're teaching design, sort of helping students find the essence of, of the idea or the essence of the image or the building blocks for how you create something from that? Absolutely. I mean, it's, yeah. it's really knowing the play. Right. It's, and, and it's letting the play talk to you. And, and we're, you know, encouraging our students constantly about the, not, not what is the story generally, what is the story specifically, and what's the story to them specifically? How do they relate to the story? And what's the connection to the story? And why does the story need to be told? Mm -hmm. and should be told or you know it's it's so understanding not only the story but the audience the story is for mm -hmm. and and the connection that's going to happen you know between the the performing you know the performer and the the audience that that stuff we can't control mm -hmm. in a way except that's all we do is control it right exactly <laughs> Are, are you surprised sometimes by where inspiration comes from for you or where an image comes from? Like, 
because like I'm thinking of when we did well and you designed that big arrow that went out into the audience, which yeah. like is not something that came to my mind when I read the play. But when you showed me that picture, I was like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. Yeah, do you remember how hard that was when everybody freaked out that we put that arrow <laughs> over the seat and, and, and know. you know, whatever, it's whatever. Conversation. It's a it limitation was, of our space, but, you know, yeah. just like broke it. But, but the play, I don't know where, Braden, I don't know where like a, a particular inspiration comes from. I remember just so clearly feeling that play of this woman that needed to be both in and out. Mm -hmm. I want to be inside. I want to fit, but I want to get out of here. I don't want to fit. It was like, and, and the arrow happened almost automatically. Every sketch I did ended up a way out. Right. Somehow. And, and so in a way I just started listening to it. And when I, I'll never forget when I showed it to you, you went, this is crazy. I love this. <laughs> like, it was, you know. Yeah. That's that's what makes those kinds of collaborations so much fun is when I think someone comes up with a wild idea and you go, oh, no, that's actually exactly it. And you kind of run with it. And it's the same with that giant beam that you had for time of your life that just like slashed through the space. It's like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Um, you. Yeah, you, I remember you. I remember you talking about that. We met on the sidewalk in Seattle. Yeah, right. That, and you told me about the impact that show had on you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk to you because we're kind of on the subject of, of the, those first moments of creation. I, I wanted to talk about new plays because you do a lot of new work. And, um, you know, you've de designed for many new plays. And um, you were the resident designer at the uh, O'Neill Center, which some of our viewers may not know that the Eugene O'Neill Center in Connecticut is um, was sort of the, the very first sort of new play workshop of its kind, um, where playwrights would go, including, I mean, many great playwrights over the last 50 or 60 years, including August Wilson, and started a lot of his plays there. But it's a it's a place that's has a kind of a very pure mission that's dedicated to the playwright and the development of their work in a very kind of holistic way. And you were a resident designer there for that festival. And it's very unusual for a designer to be to work directly with a playwright in that way. I mean, usually the 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 director is always sort of in the conversation and um part of the conversation and you know as a director i don't know why you'd want to talk to the playwright but uh, <laughs> but uh but i i just think it's such a cool thing for for a designer to be in the room with a playwright when they're really making the play for the first time or hearing it for the first time or in those very early stages of the play just starting to form and um i know we have some some in images from another conference that you did as well, but I'd, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about your experience working in that way with playwrights. I was in, um, when I was in, in uh, grad school with, with Lloyd Richards, he, we designed a, a production together of a dollhouse. And when I got into the play, I asked him, um, I said, are we doing a doll house or are we doing a doll's house? And he said, I'll get back to you. <laughs> and he called me back the next day and he said, why did you ask me that question? And I said, because I don't know where to begin unless mm -hmm. you tell me that answer. Because is it a woman that's trapped in a house or is it a family that's trapped in a house? Is it a, what's, I, there's, it's a very different approach to the play. And so that conversation led to Lloyd asking me to come to the playwrights, the, the you know, to come to the, up to the O'Neill and to work with playwrights in the summers. And I stayed for 20 years. And Lloyd and, Richards, for everybody who doesn't know, is the arti longtime artistic director of, of the O'Neill. National Center. Playwrights Conference. National Playwrights Conference. Thank you. Yeah. And and he um, 
and he was followed by Jim Houghton. And I stayed, you know, because Lloyd told me, and I, I, I had the same question you had, Braden. It's like, what do you want me to talk about with playwrights? Like, why do you want me to talk to playwrights? I had no idea. And um, he said, remember that question you asked me? And I said, yeah. And he said, that's why I want you to talk to playwrights. And because everything matters. Absolutely everything matters. And it's never about, and he said, you're sensitive enough to never tell a writer how to write their play. But your questions might come at it very differently than other people's questions. And so the first meeting I had, I think it was with Keith Redeen. I, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it was. And it was a design meeting. And Lloyd had told me he wanted me to talk to playwrights. And so we were sitting on the porch of an old farmhouse and we were talking and the director was talking and the dramaturg was talking and the writer wasn't saying a word and i after that meeting went to lloyd's office and i said i don't know why you want me here and he said it's it's i said that's like a design meeting what i do for business you know for my work and i said if you really want the playwright to talk to the designer then the other people have to not talk and because they're tr they have a job to do, they're trying to figure out this from a very different place. And so we said, well, just tell them not to talk. And these are like famous directors, and right. famous dramaturgs. And I'm, I'm like a young designer. And I, I just said, OK, so I brought a roll of gaff tape that I put on my wrist. And I said, we're going to have, with the next meeting, I said, we're going to have a different meeting where the directors and the dramaturgs cannot talk. The only people that can talk is the designers and the writer. And well, that, that was the beginning of that, I just want to say that that was the beginning of that because when I was directing at the O'Neill just a few years ago, that has, you know, that's that that is now the code. That and that's been the code for many years. Oh yeah. And, 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 it, so, and it it was so valuable. Right. And and so of course the directors hated that at first, right? And they but it was so valuable just because of the difference in the kind of questions that are asked, because if the writer doesn't see it, I can't see it. Mm. And so it's, it's really probing them to, to help us see their world. So part of my job when I did that was to have, have this meeting and then do a sketch based on what I took from the writer when I was there, one of the writers was Jenny Mahoney, who wrote a play that became eventually became artistic director of Seven Devils Play Foundry. Mm -hmm. And Jenny had asked me over the years several times if I'd come and do a similar thing with them that I did at the O'Neill. But be, I didn't I felt I was obligated to the O'Neill and couldn't do that. But after I left the O'Neill and then I was teaching full time and I just didn't have room. But this summer, because of the our distancing, I agreed to do this. So these sketches we're seeing grew out of that direct dialogue between the designers and the playwright. And then it was to give, at least for a stage reading, the audience a sense of what this would be if it were realized, what, what could actually happen. Right. So there were three plays. We just worked on three plays. This was the one that's up now is, is um, The Killing Fields by Anya Pearson. Mm -hmm. I love, and uh, Hattie, Hattie's helping us behind the scenes, folks. Can, can you go back to that first? One? Yeah. I just love that the, there's, I love how um, sort of surreal some of these images are and that there's, they they certainly can translate to a stage, but it doesn't seem like they're bound by any of the kind of practical confines of what is possible on a stage. It's like they're very much um, from a kind of intuitive, almost they're 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 feel like a sort of pure expression that's not bound by any of the practicalities of what it takes to put it on stage. Not to say that it isn't possible, but it's like, it really exists in that moment of creation. It's funny, you know, this is a, this is a play called You Will Get Sick by yep. Noah Diaz. And 
It's a, it's a, it's someone that gets ill and goes through their life and they're slowly turning to straw mm. and they end up going home and crows basically, you know, pick them apart in the cornfield. And it's so, you know, in my imagination, the crows are all white shadows that are flying around in there. So as much as it's impractical and sort of, you know, poetic and romantic in a way, it's mm -hmm. also incredibly practical. Right. Uh, I don't think there's anything that, that I do that can't be done. I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to put that straw field up in the air, but your TV does. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that about you. You just say, this is it. And then, and off, and usually 95% of the time or 99% of the time, you figure out a way to do it. Yeah, we really do. And it's, it's like a team, that's the collaboration. That's a team of people and it's getting them to actually believe in the idea. And then they'll always make it better than we can make it. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they're magic mm -hmm. if they believe in it. Right. I love that when we did um, um, when we did Last of the Boys, when that image, the, the the landscape, and still one of my favorite images of that night and the and the and the young soldier up in the in the shadows and walking down the landscape, and I just remember sort of those meetings how we talked about what that landscape needed to be and how we would do it on the stage, and it felt both sort of very real and also, you know, of, of the imagination at the same time, just like I think Dietz intended it to be, it had this kind of surreal quality of what can happen late at night when you're out in the wilderness. Yeah. Uh, and it's haunting. It was and haunting. haunting. Yeah. But yeah, I love that. I love the elements of these images. Can we, can we scroll through the next one? Tell us a little bit about this one. This is the alligator gospels, and it's um, it's it's a woman that that has been corrupted by a belief in a new religion, and she's um, wearing an alligator robe, and um, goes out to the wilderness to sort of make make a connection, and it's it's really a family play about a sister that comes home and these two sisters that are you know, trying to find their connection to, to themselves and religion is in the middle of it in, or this new found kind of religion. So it was, you know, the idea of the moon being the spotlight and the, you know, the, she's in this, the, I don't know, the landscape, I was thinking of alligator teeth and like, it's just, you know, the thing about these sketches that's so fun is it is solely a response to the writer and right. what the writer's saying and what's the, you know, and I'm not saying, Braden, it's not fun to work with directors. <laughs> it, it, it really is. But when, when the writer just says, you know, it's like an alligator, the whole thing is like the mouth of an alligator. I can just run with that, you know, it's, and, and in fact, I think it's your work with writers that just gives it more and more validity that it gets stronger and stronger. So I, I don't want to for a second say, like, that's not what I mean. But there's a pureness to just listening to a writer talk about they don't know how to do it. They don't know, you know, but it's just then when they see what I do based on their words, it's really kind of wonderful to, to listen to them go, wow. Yeah. I can but see how I can it gives, get there. gives a lot of a writer a lot of confidence about the world being manifested and and what's possible, um, and see really kind of being able to imagine it in three dimensions that way, um, and those layers of interpretation. I think for me, that's what's so um, sort of thrilling as a theater artist is to you have what's in your mind, and then you see how it comes through your collaborators and you and, and it starts to fill it out in a completely new way. Um, so I imagine for playwrights, that's often really thrilling to be to really see it for the first time, like, oh, that's what I imagined, or it's come something completely different, but even more inspiring, or that's not it at all, you know, like, I learned that at the O'Neill, 
Yeah. And it, it was really, you know, I mean, August actually was incredible in his development of turning into a playwright from being a poet and mm -hmm. starting to actually claim the stage and think about the stage as a character was a wonderful journey to be on with him. And that's, that's where I learned that. It wasn't from him, it was from him understanding what was happening with all these other writers and you know, to watch him grow that way was pretty extraordinary. Thanks. Thanks, Hattie, for, for showing those. Um, I wanted to talk, just kind of pivoting to, to, to right now and, and talk to you a little bit about what you're designing kind of for the digital realm, because I know this is not a new area for you. You've been kind of innovating in this area for a while, but um, you know, what kind of innovation do you see happening in the digital space right now? Or are you working on in the digital space and what makes theater still theater in the digital space? It's, it's, you know, th there's no doubt it's the most remarkable challenge to have what feels alive in on a screen mm -hmm. and in a box or in a, you know, that it is, you know, what, what makes it immediate? What gives it validity? What, how do you not get lost in the technology? How does the technology not overwhelm? And it, it just keeps going back to story. What's the story? And if the story is human and the story, we are connecting to the story, we have that connection to the story, then, then you know, what I've been playing with is trying to make sure that the tech of it, the technology of it, the whether it's virtual reality or augmented reality or extended reality, each of those things are different things, but it's ultimately a human interacting with an artificial something, whatever that is. And I just keep reminding myself to, it's all about the human. And so it's playing with scale, it's playing with proportion, it's playing with the idea of getting distance in a, in a room like you're in right now, or, or a close up in the room right now that isn't about the camera. It's about the need to be bigger or smaller or the, and so it's a, it's a constant struggle. I have no answer. I have absolutely no answers, except I see a lot of really bad things that the technology is more important than the story. And, and I am bored, I'm just bored. And if I can find a way and continually struggle to find a way to make it not about the technology, to really make it about, keep it focused on the story, it's, it's, um, it's gonna happen. I mean, I'm, I'm working on a show right now on Alex, the, the um, famous designer, uh, fashion designer, couture designer, Alexander McQueen. And, there's a producer that has very little theater experience that is investing in the idea of that this team of people that I'm working with can create a show. And we have enough time to slowly develop the show. So I'm developing the show in maybe a theater, maybe a warehouse, maybe a tent, maybe a factory, Maybe in Milan, maybe in Paris, maybe in New York, maybe in like, there is no boundary to how this is going to happen. And yet we're, we're struggling to actually make sure we're telling the story that deserves to happen. All the other stuff doesn't matter. That will all happen somehow. So it's a story of transformation into the imagination and the way the imagination continues to grow and, and eventually becomes our salvation. Hmm. And, and that's the story we're trying to tell. And, and so it's, I've got all these, I'm experimenting with screens and mirrors and, you know, but ultimately it all is just around a figure and a person in a reason that they're there and telling something. I know I'm not answering your question exactly because 
I don't know how to. Yeah. But this world that I'm in is going to teach me. I'm going to find those balances between what feels like magic and is wow to get scale and impact, but at the same time to just have a little boy sitting in a bathtub. You know, that it's 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 really an amazing thing and I'm trying to figure that out now that it could be on a digital platform. It could be in, you know, as well as where's the boundary between theater, film, projection, where I'm tr just like you said about trying to break the boundaries of set designer, costume designer, lighting designer. I'm trying to t break the boundaries of those traditional uses of things and find new ways to do stuff. Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty excited. Yeah, it sounds like having time. Right. And when, if you have time to experiment. And, and trying to find the exact form that matches the content of that story. What's the most expressive way to tell that story, of course, is what we're always searching for, I think, when we, when we talk about design and when we talk about putting up a play. It's no different. It's just that you have, we're, we're outside of, like you said, the box that we typically play in. And I find as theater artists, like for me, that, that, that those restrictions are also often are the things that give give the create give the creativity you know it's like you have to have those restrictions right but when there are none i mean there are and that we can't be on the stage but when the restrictions are different and you have all this possibility in terms of the digital space and what that is it's a whole other thing to kind of wrap your mind around um, and the two-dimensionality of it is also something that's hard for me to get past because it's so much about being in in real space and real time with people and you can get the real time like you can have a sense of liveness which to me gives it uh, there's always going to be theater in that but getting past the two-dimensionality i was talking to the director tabi mcgar last last one of these creative conversations about that idea and how you how that how that becomes a unique challenge and, and, and how you address that theatrically, which is happening, but it's, it's, it's very different. It's not, it's not theater as I think of it, but it is a kind of hybrid of theater and film. It's something else um, that does, could be cool. And there are, there's some interesting experiment. That's happening. I, I think there is, I mean, Simon McBurney in Complicite you know, playing with the idea of 360 sound, how sound can get in your head. Yeah, I love that. Be around to change the dimension of space, the way space. So it's not, it's it's never just the the vision alone. It's really the the experience of being it. And I think that leans toward beginning to break the frame of mm -hmm. the, that we feel like we're in it or inside it. And it's a way that's very different than, than you know, um, when you're watching a video game or you're watching a, you know, that it's, is because those are immersive environments. I mean, you can get inside those, but it's there, there's a kind of artifice to them that is so alienating. It, it, it pushes you out rather than really brings you in. And so the thing I'm excited about is tr tr trying to find those hooks that actually push us in and transcend the idea of, you know, it's there's different shows happening now with distancing and, you know, all those things, but all the rules that the actors have to go through and to, and, you know, there's, it's, there's nothing natural it all ends up artificial in a way. And so I think we'll get better and better with breaking down those, the artifice of it, the bad artifice of it in, in action. But I, I'm still hopeful that we can do it in, in a multitude of ways at the same time. It's not like I don't wanna go do live theater again, because of course I do. I can't wait for us to do something again. But I also, am excited by this new thing and what can we do with this thing that that is it's you're absolutely right it's not theater but it's not film right it's and it's right. not it's something else right and, and i don't think i think people are experimenting with it 
in an exciting way. But I don't think there's ever anybody that's going to become the master of this. It's, it's really each thing is going to earn itself. Yeah. Well, I look forward to seeing what comes of this project that you're working on and, um, and you know, where we're going to be in the next six to nine months, hopefully we'll start to be coming back by then. But I, I also think that the, the discoveries that we're making now and the evolution that's happening now and the, the discoveries we're making about form and whatever this hybrid is will stay with us and continue to develop side by side with live performance when it comes back. And that's kind of thrilling too, to think about how the two could intersect. You know, there's already a lot of intersection that was happening before the pandemic around video projection and live feeds and, you know, simul, you know, and recorded stuff. And I think this opens up a whole new sort of world of possibility of expression when we think about uh, how some of the things we're discovering now could come back once, once the live event comes back. So it, it's also affecting our audience. Right. Well, that's the other thing, right? Yeah. So our audience is now not only hungry for theater, but they're beginning to appreciate a different form, I hope, and that there's a different kind of scrutiny and a different kind of awareness. There's, there's a, you know, one of our students said, and, and she was so right, that she's hopeful that this world is going to create a new kind of intimacy in theater, that, mm -hmm. that it is, and, and I believe that wholeheartedly, that there, it doesn't take a billion dollars mm -hmm. only, that it takes an idea and a story and a communication. And if that happens between two people, because that's the only way we can do it, that's theater. And if it happens between a thousand people, that's theater too. It, it, I don't know. I'm, I'm just, I'm hopeful that, you know, it's, it, 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 it before March, you know, to pay 600 bucks to see a Broadway show is outrageous because it's so isolating. So many people don't get to see that show. And I'm just hopeful we change. I hope, I think it's, this is a reboot that might have some good. Yeah, absolutely. And there's the appreciation, I think, once we get, past, I mean, there's the appreciation part. And then there's also the other thing that you were talking about in terms of the emotional connection part, which to me is the essential ingredient. It's like how the audience and those actors are emotion, connecting emotionally. That's what I'm after. And how do we get to that? What, how do we create those moments of those deep moments of connection um, through this, you know, through this, this lens, this, this medium? Um, and it, it, it's possible. It is. I, I, I've seen it occasionally. I also see it fail brilliantly and yeah. because an actor doesn't have anything to play to. They're not. Right. Exactly. They're, there's nothing there. And so it's our job to figure out how to give them something to play to. Right. That they're connecting to the, the, the other actors in a way. And so it's, you know, it's there's lots of ways to begin to experiment doing that yeah well thanks skip it's been a pleasure as always to talk to you about these big ideas and what you're up to and i appreciate you taking the time to join us tonight so it's thank great you. it's great just seeing you i miss you <laughs> <laughs> i miss uh, working yeah me too <laughs> all right uh well um, thanks to all of you out there for spending some time with Skip and I tonight and coming together virtually um, to share these conversations with us. If you are able, we invite you to consider making a gift to Seattle Rep today so that we can continue to connect to our community and share our creativity and the creativity of all the uh, astounding artists that we work with and continue to put theater at the heart of public life. Thank you again for joining us and good night. Take care of each other.